So at some point you might need to dig into your 3D printer's firmware configuration, whether it's to update to a more recent version or even to get your newly built 3D printer going at all. So where do you get started? Well, take my hand, I'll show you the world of C++ configuration files that control everything about your 3D printer. So the firmware and its configuration literally runs your 3D printer. and the firmware in turn runs on a microcontroller on the mainboard. It controls everything from the motors over the heaters to an LCD screen and SD card reader, but it's also responsible for handling more abstract concepts like acceleration, reasonable speed limits, thermal regulation and safety, and in some cases even the complex calculation necessary for a delta printer to understand X, Y and Z coordinates. So in this video, I want to teach you the basics of configuring the current version of the popular Marlin firmware. I don't have any exact numbers here, but in some form, it probably runs 99% of all 3D printers. If you have a 3D printer that Marlin won't run on because it uses a more modern processor than the Atmega series, your firmware is still going to have many of the same options and you'll still learn what the configuration options mean and how you can change them to better suit your needs. So there are a few things you'll have to know about your 3D printer when configuring any firmware. These are not things that need to be calibrated or tweaked and tuned, they are constants you'll be able to plop right into your configuration. And those are the type of mainboard used. The Marlin firmware is made for Arduino compatible boards and most of them are somewhat interchangeable in regards to the things the firmware cares about, but it's easy enough to read off the mainboard's name. Next up, what sort of 3D printer you're using, so whether it's a normal Cartesian machine or a Delta or something completely different. I'll be showing you the configuration for a regular Cartesian machine. What goes along with that is the printing area in the X, Y and Z direction, or at least the length in each of those directions the printer will be able to move before crashing into things. Also what sort of belts and pulleys are used, as well as the micro-stepping setting of the stepper motor drivers and the amount of steps the stepper motor needs to do a full rotation. This will let you calculate the steps per millimeter value the firmware needs to position each axis correctly. I've made a video on that that explains all those parameters and how to calculate the effective steps per millimeter value, which you can watch here. You also need a steps per millimeter value for the extruder, which is the one thing that you should calibrate. And if you want to know more about that, you can watch the video on that exact topic also here. Next up, which hardened you're using and heated bed if you have one. This is important to know the type of temperature sensor it's using, commonly a thermistor, but you still need the exact type to get accurate readings. Typically, the manufacturer will list the exact model used. Now, if you can get hold of a pre-configured version of Marlin for your specific 3D printer, you can read all of those parameters from the original configuration file and punch them into the new one. Just don't copy paste the entire file, that will definitely cause some issues. But even if you can't get a ready to go but outdated copy, you might be able to extract most of these settings if you already have a version of Marlin running on your 3D printer by sending an M501 command. So now that we have the basic settings collected and are ready to go on that front, let's look into what you need as far as software and actual firmware files. As Marlin is based on Arduino, we're going to use the Arduino software as an easy way to edit and upload the firmware files. You can download it from arduino.cc and chances are you already have it installed. Now the Marlin firmware itself is available from marlinfw.org. Right now that only links to the GitHub repository, but I guess there'll be a direct download available sometime in the future. If you're downloading from GitHub, hit the green clone or download button and select download as zip. Unpack that file somewhere and you'll find the marlin.ino file inside, which will open up with Arduino. Now in the Arduino interface, you're going to see all these tabs with all the different firmware files. The two files that are interesting for us are configuration.h and configuration.edv.h for the more advanced configuration options. For now, we're going to stick to the configuration.h file and I'm going to take you through the core options in here that are important for getting your 3D printer to work. There are a lot of other options available as well, but those aren't strictly necessary for your 3D printer to function. 
So one of the important things here is the note about Delta or Scara printers or you know printers that don't have the standard Cartesian XYZ setup. For a Delta printer, you can get pre-made configuration files as well for Scara printers. And that doesn't only apply to the Delta and Scara kinematics, that also applies to common Cartesian printers. So if you jump back into the Marlin directory, we can find the example configurations folder, which contains those two files, the configuration.age and configuration.age files um, for a lot of common and popular printers. For example, if you want to configure a delta, you can find a generic delta configuration set that you can start working off of. Or if you've got some other printer that already comes with configuration files, you can skip most of the configuration part right there by copying these two files and pasting them into the main directory, overriding the two default files that are in there. So the first few options in here are mostly cosmetic. The first important one that you might want to look into is the baud rate. This determines the communication speed of the printer with your host. The default of 250,000 might not work with every configuration. So if you end up with trouble connecting to your printer, try the one slower speed, which is 115,200. Just type that value in there to apply it. Most of the times though, 250,000 will work just fine. The next important setting is the choice of a motherboard. In this case, the motherboard is pre-configured for a RAMS 1.4 with a configuration for an extruder, a fan, and a bed on the power outputs. You can see all the different boards that are supported in the boards.h file, which should show up up here. But since my monitor is running out of space, you can use the drop-down menu and open up the boards.h file right there. And that will give you a list of all the boards that are supported out of the box. Just pick the one that matches what yours is called and either grab the name and copy paste it or grab the number, either one works. Let's say I want to configure a Rambo board. I can just copy paste the board Rambo name and, and drop it right in here. For boards like the RAMs, you can choose how to configure your power outputs, whether you want to hook up a hot end, a fan and a heated bed, or whether you want to configure it for a dual hot ends and a single heated bed, but no part cooling fan. The default setting should be fine and is probably the way most people wire up their printers. Moving along, really the next setting that is important is the thermistor or temperature sensor setting. And this is where your research about your heated bed and hot end temperature sensor comes in. So again, you've got a long list of all the different temperature sensors that are supported. And what you should do is just pick the one that is closest to the one that is in your hot end. So for example, the common Semitech 104 GT2 is number five. So for a hot end that uses that temperature sensor, we're gonna define temp sensor zero as five and that will tell it that your first hardened most of the cases your only hardened is using this type of temperature sensor many heated beds come with a generic 100k thermistor and that's this one it's not the most accurate one it's not the most precise one but for a heated bed it's going to be good enough so in that case drop in 10 cents bed one moving along the next two settings are safety features so the min temp setting makes sure that when you're using a thermistor, that thermistor is actually reading something and not disconnected. A min temp of five is okay, which means below a temperature reading of five degrees Celsius, the firmware is going to report an error. Now for the max temp, that's basically making sure you don't destroy your own hot end because a lot of hot ends will heat up much higher than what they are designed for. I'd recommend putting a maximum temperature of 260 degrees in here if you're using a PTFE based hot end or if you're using an all metal hot end but don't have it rated for up to 300 degrees Celsius. Most filaments will print just fine with 260 degrees. The same for the bed, most beds don't go much higher than 120 and that is realistically the maximum temperature you should be using. The next block of settings deals with the PID settings. So basically PID is a temperature control mode that gives you much finer and much more granular control over how your heated bed and hot end will heat up and maintain its temperature. For the hot end, the PID loop is enabled by default and it's using some default values that work for an Ultimaker hot end. Unless your hot end manufacturer provides a set of KP, KI and KD values for your specific hot end, 
you should simply leave these as default for now and tune them once you've uploaded the firmware. I've made a video on that, which you can watch right there. You can also enable PID control for the heated bed, which I like to do since it gives the bed a more stable control as well. So to enable that feature, remove the two forward slashers in front of the define, and that will change your bed's temperature control mode from simply switching it on with full power and then switching it off with full power again to a more gradual control. And the same thing applies as to the hot end. These are simply default control values with a KP, KI, and KD. You should tune them with something like this command afterwards. Next up, these two settings right here are very important to leave enabled, thermal protection hotends and thermal protection bed. These are simply two pre-configured safety features that keep your printer from destroying itself should something go wrong in some way. These actually work really well these days and I'd really urge you to keep them enabled. If they trigger during regular use, there is something wrong with your printer. Do not simply disable safety features to make it work. Next up, the end stop settings. This first section allows you to configure which end stops you're using, whether you've got end stops connected on the minimum position of X, Y, and Z, or whether you've got them on the maximum position or on both. To enable any of these, simply remove the comment before them or comment the line out again to remove that end stop. This next block of settings right here is going to come in handy later on. It allows you to invert the logic of your end stop. So in case one of your end stops always shows up triggered when it's not and shows up open when you're actually pressing it down, this is the point where you need to change the false to true. So by changing that false to true, you're saying, hey, my Z min end stop has an inverted logic behind and please compensate for that accordingly. Unless you know you should change these, leave them on their default and we'll figure it out once we've uploaded the first version of the firmware. The next section deals with Z probe options for bed leveling bed auto compensation. I've made an entire video about that, which covers all of these settings in great detail. It's a bit too much for this one, but once you've got your printer running and everything else sorted out, I'd definitely recommend adding a bed probe. So the next section of important settings are way down here at the section motion. So here's the position where you enter your steps per unit, max feed rate, max acceleration, and so on. The steps per unit you've hopefully already calculated before this. For the extruder, if you don't have a precise value you should be putting in here, leave it as default and calibrate it afterwards. If you've got a freshly built printer, I'd also recommend lowering the maximum feed rates a bit to something like 200 millimeters a second, which is still very fast if you look at it, but isn't as likely to cause any issues from skipping stepper motors. The max accelerations are by default pretty low, but they are okay that way because they will make for a very smooth and reliable experience. And to plug another video yet again, I've also made one about tuning these values to give you the maximum speed that your printer will be able to handle. Down here at the additional features, there is one that you might look into and that is EEPROM settings. You will read a lot in forums and on other pages that you can simply reconfigure some of your core settings of your firmware by sending a G-code command. And that only works if you remove this comment up here and enable the EEPROM settings menu. For now, I'd actually recommend leaving this commented out as the EEPROM settings will override any configuration changes you make in the config file and might cause some confusion as to why your changes aren't applied properly. Next up, there is the LCD and SD support section. Again, I've made a video about setting up an LCD display and an SD card reader with your printer after you've configured everything else. For now, we're gonna leave this as default. This is the safe setting and it will work just like that. But remember, you can always add an LCD panel later on. So if you want to have a look at all the other extra features you can configure in Marlin, you can have a look at all these settings down here and, you know, just look into what else you could set up with this sort of firmware. For now, we're not going to touch these as they aren't important to your 3D printer functioning with its basic set of features. All right, and that's all for the actual firmware configuration for right now. And if you want to do so before uploading, you can verify your sketch. This is also a nice check after you've done any configuration changes to make sure that you haven't messed up the formatting, you know, missed a bracket or a semicolon somewhere. 
In my case, it's throwing an error that it's saying, hey, you've got the wrong board selected. So we're just gonna do that right now. We're gonna to go to tools, board, and we're gonna say we have a board that is based on an Arduino Mega or Mega 2560. Change that, and we're gonna verify it again. This compilation process will take a while, so don't worry, it's not freezing up, it's just taking a minute or two. To upload the firmware to your actual control board, make sure you've selected the right serial port and hit upload. The main board will start flashing and once it's stopped flashing and once the Arduino IDE tells you the upload is completed, you can connect it with any printer host of your choice. I'm going to use Print Run for this. So here's a couple of basic checks that you can do to make sure you don't have any major errors in your configuration. Before you power up your printer's power supply, Connect to the board with your favorite RepRap host software and check that the temperature it's reporting are plausible. If not, you probably selected the wrong thermistor. As you turn on the power supply, make sure that these temperatures don't start rising on their own and that no part of the control board starts cooking or smoking or glowing red hot. Those are all things you typically want to avoid. When it passes that test, use the host to move each axis by a bit and check that it moves in the right direction. Keep in mind that the movements are taken from the nozzle relative to the bed. So if you have a moving bed and move Y+, plus, the bed should move towards you. Use the right hand rule to get a basic idea of which axis has its positive direction at which end. Hold out your right hand like this and from your point of view, this is X, this is Y and this is Z positive when you're looking at the printer from the front. If any axis moves in the wrong direction, Either change the invert dir setting for that axis in Marlin or flip the motor's connector around. If an axis only moves in one direction, the end stop inverted setting is probably wrong. To get the end stops completely tested, check their functionality by homing one axis at a time, but keep a finger on the power switch. If the axis starts moving away from the end stop, change the home dir setting for that axis that will invert that exact direction. Once the axis moves towards the end stop after the home command, try stopping it by triggering the end stop by hand before your 3D printer reaches it, so that the axis doesn't crash into the end stop if something is set up wrong. If it doesn't react to the end stop when homing at all, you probably have it hooked up to the wrong axis or you swapped some pins. Sending M119 to your printer will tell you which end stop you're actually triggering at the moment, which you can use to manually test and diagnose each one for whether it's connected to the right axis and actually functional. Now, before you start printing anything, don't forget to calibrate your extruder if you used an estimated steps per millimeter value for it. And it's probably also a good idea to align your bed and set your Z axis end stop to the correct height. After that, you should be able to slice and print your first few files. This video is sponsored by Alif Objects Inc., a free software, Libre Innovation and open source hardware company headquartered in Loveland, Colorado, USA and makers of Lultzbot desktop 3D printers. Watch my reviews of both Lultzbot 3D printers here and check the links in the video description for more info on these machines straight from Alif Objects. So I hope this video helped you getting started on your printer's firmware. There are a bunch more features that you can add and I've already made and will keep making videos on all of these. Now for this video, if you enjoyed it, leave it a thumbs up, if not a thumbs down. If you want to stay up to date as new videos come out, get subscribed and that's about it. See you in the next one or in the weekly live stream every weekend right here on YouTube.